from Hollywood, California. I know you're going to dig this. It's the Tom Likas Show. Check this out. And now, and now, here he is, Tom Likas. Thank you for tuning in to the Tom Likas Show. This is where America gets together to talk about the issues you really care about. It's a different kind of radio talk program. We're the radio talk show that is not hosted by a right-wing wacko or a convicted felon. No! I am your host. I got our telephone number. You're going to need it. It's 1-800-5800-TALK. 1-800-5800-866. Thank you for tuning in. You're going to be glad you tuned in to this hour of the Tom Likas Show. Because this hour of the Tom Likas Show pays off the most often asked question on this program. And the question, very simply, is whatever happened to Awatuki Sue? Whatever happened to her? And um, for those of you who don't know who Awatuki Sue is, maybe uh, you're new to the program. Maybe you've heard the question asked, whatever happened to that Awatuki Sue? And I always have to give some nondescript answer like, well, we don't know, or the police are working on it, or whatever. Let's go back in time to November 2006. And by the way, we were doing a broadcast from Portland, Oregon. We were in front of a room full of drunken reprobates in Portland. And uh, normally on Friday when we do a show in front of a big crowd, you know, we're not doing anything heavy, anything serious. There's no particular topic. And somewhere along the way, someone called in and uh, got into a conversation with me about child support. So then I received a call from a listener in Ahwatukee, which is not a city, by the way. It's an area south of Phoenix, Arizona. And uh, this woman, who called herself Sue, called in, and this is what the call sounded like back in November 2006. My ex and I work at the same hospital. Um, we have a child together. And uh, why did you, I, why, wait, wait, is he your ex-husband? No, uh, more like an ex-one-night stand thing that happened. So he's not your ex-anything? Well, he's, uh, uh, well, he's dead now. <laughs> He's dead now. He's dead now. Well, we'll get to, we'll get to the, wait, wait, wait. We'll get to that part in a second. So, let me guess. You had a one night stand with the guy and when you told him you were pregnant, he said, that's terrible. Please don't have this baby. No. What did no. he say? Um, well, he actually was a little bit not one way or the other. He didn't say don't have it. He didn't say let's get married. He was just like, oh. I was young and uh, didn't quite know what to do, so I did end up having the baby. How old were you? I was 19. You were 19, so you were an adult. Well, yes, but Not well, a little yes. naive, inexperienced. But an adult. Right. All yes. right. Hadn't had that many boyfriends, that kind of thing. Right. Um, I'm a nurse, work at a hospital, so is he. Um, so I had the baby and, um, then he refused to give me child support. So since I happened to know where he worked, I petitioned that with the court and they started, um, taking it from his check every month. Well, um, he got mad. He quit his job so that I couldn't get child support. I got really mad. Um, I went over and tried to talk to him just about doing some under the table money. He wouldn't listen. So I shot him. You shot him. Oh, yes, I did. You shot him dead? I did. And so, wh how often do they let you make calls from prison? I got away with it. How did you get away with it? Well, Tom, um, when the cops show up and you're a blubbering, crying woman saying that, oh, he was young and screaming, and plus he had been drinking all day. His blood alcohol level was over three times the legal limit. At least that's what the autopsy said. They, you know, oh, he was young. And he just he pulled out his gun and shot himself. And I'll be darned if uh, they were okay with that. Wait a minute. So I'm going to ask you a question here, and I'm being completely serious because this is very important. Okay. All right. 
So you had a one night stand with a guy and he knocked you up, is that right? Right. And you went to him and you told him you were going to have a baby. Right. And he didn't say have an abortion or anything. He didn't offer no. to marry you. He right. Just, he, so you went ahead and had the baby. Right. And when he when you had the baby, he wouldn't give any child support. Correct. So you went to family court and yes. they started taking the money out of his paycheck. Yes. So he quit his job so they couldn't garnish the money out of his paycheck. Yes. So you went and talked to him and asked him to give you some cash and he refused. So you shot and killed him. With his own 9 millimeter, right in the heart. And you know, I'm a nurse, so I know right where to aim for. Okay. <laughs> okay. Sue, that's yeah. good. I'm, I'm glad you're telling me this. And here's why. Let me ask you a question. So you went on trial, of course. No. You were never on trial. No. Let me understand this. You lied to the police. Right. And I you, said he shot himself. You said that he shot himself, and the police believed it. Yes, they did. And so you got away with it. Yes, I did. All right, now, so where do you live? Do you live in Phoenix or Ahwatukee? Ahwatukee. Well, here's the bad news, Sue. Since you never went on trial, you just confessed on a national radio program to committing murder. Well, but you know what? They have to prove it, and he's been cremated. Yeah, but they've got your confession on tape. You but just confessed. But people call up and make stories all the time. Yeah, um, but you know what, Sue? I'm, I'm going to tell, tell you something. We have an 800 number, and when you call in, because we pay for the call, we have your phone number. And I'm well, gonna, that's fine. It's not my cell phone. It's my doesn't friend. matter, because the police department's going to find you. And when we find you, you will go on trial. That was a very uh, tough call uh, to take in front of a drunken crowd of morons who kept shouting, who cares, shut up, uh, like they were not even aware of what was happening on the air. Uh, joining me now is Sergeant Joel Tranter of the Phoenix Police Department. Now, we took that call on the air, and the first thing we did, we did not call the media, the first thing we did was we called the Phoenix PD. And um, although many people love to say, oh, it's radio and this is some kind of hoax that's been uh, uh, perpetrated just to get ratings or what have you, um, Sergeant Tranter took us seriously. And uh, behind the scenes, he has been working hand in hand with us and we've been working hand in hand with him and his people uh, to try to flesh this out. Uh, he joins us now. Sergeant Tratter, thank you for being with us. Uh, you're welcome, Tom. Thanks for having me on. Uh, we're, we're, we're excited, cautiously, of course. Uh, what can you tell us, first of all, uh, there was a name published in the newspaper today in um, the, the East Valley, which, comprises, which is comprised of uh, Scottsdale, Mesa, Tempe. Uh, is, is the name in the newspaper the name of that person? Uh, that is correct. Um, it's Phoenix Police policy. Uh, when we have a suspect identified but not yet arrested, we as the police department don't publish that name. But I can tell you the name that is out there, uh, that is true and accurate. So, so that, so that for name is true. Our listeners, because our show is no longer on in Phoenix, the radio station changed format since then. Uh, for our listeners who cannot see the East Valley Tribune, what is the name of Awatuki Sioux? Uh, well, I, I'm limited, uh, legally speaking. I can't release that name, but uh, I can tell you now, right now, the, the local media is publishing her name. They have a right to do that. They've done a uh, public records request. We've honored those requests. We have released the police reports, but I have to stay within policy I and understand. somewhat still uh, limited on saying her name. I will tell you, though, that uh, Sue was, uh, was her middle name. Uh, so she was partially correct when she did uh, make that call, but we do have her positively identified as of, as of uh, last year, and we just uh, uh, submitted four criminal charges uh, within the last 24 hours. Now, um, for, for people who've been listening and trying to follow this, you know, I, I do believe, and, and we talk to police officers all the time all over the country, and we know how tough your job is. And it's my belief that a TV show like Cold Case to take an example that might relate to what we're talking about here, makes it look very easy. Okay. I mean, those guys wrap up a case in 60 minutes, and they, they move on to the next case next week. Right, and that's 60 minutes, and that's with commercials included. So Th That's uh, right. Little dose reality. We do have, with Phoenix PD, we do have uh, several uh, cold case detectives that work homicide, work uh, sexually motivated crimes, 
Uh, but the, the truth of the matter is, on a typical cold case, uh, it takes years, and the workload that these particular detectives have is a lot. So they have to look through the, uh, the caseload that they have, prioritize those cases by which cases most likely can be solved, which has the better evidence, and so on and so forth, and actively work those cases. Fortunately, though, in the past five years or ten years with DNA in Phoenix PD, we do have our own DNA lab, and technology has improved, not to the level of what you see in Hollywood and, and what you see on the, the evening TV shows, uh, but our technology has definitely increased, and that those improvements are aiding our, our detectives. There's no doubt about that. Well, I think, but, that, I think that's great, but what happened in this case, we started getting calls from listeners literally three days later. Uh, well, what's happened with that uh, Sue from Awatuki? Well, uh, let me give you a, let's, let's, uh, give a little time frame here, uh, Tom. As you're well aware, if you received that call, just so your listeners are aware of what, what was involved in this particular investigation, and that was on November 3rd of 2006 is when you aired that air sh- that particular show, and I believe you were uh, transmitting from Portland, Oregon. Yeah. And you're nationally syndicated, so you actually received thousands of phone calls from around the country and a good number of phone calls from Arizona. And your listeners just listened to the uh, recording you just played. So our investigators were very limited on the information. We just had a name, Sue, and she mentioned she lived in Ahwatukee. Ahwatukee is basically a bedroom community, residential area within the boundaries of the city of Phoenix. That's essentially all we had. Now, you contacted us. Uh, you've been more than cooperative, and I'll take this moment and thank you and your staff, and particularly your one of your producers, Gary Zabransky, has been uh, very cooperative with us behind the scenes for more than 18 months and keeping keeping the, uh, the, the the publicity at a low level, and that greatly aided our investigators because we had a lot of work to do in the past year and a half. So just to thank you, thank you to you and your crew. But the, with the very limited information that we had, we had a name, again, from Awatuki, and that's it. So we did a court order. We subpoenaed phone records, and I can tell you there were thousands of phone records um, that were sent to us. And initially, the phone company made a made a mix up. They sent us thousands of phone records, and we started looking at them. We realized that it wasn't the exact time frame. We asked for a, a ten minute span, and due to the time change from Arizona time to Mountain Pacific time, we had to do a second court order. And there's there's again weeks and months to get those records. When we got the second batch of phone records, again that's thousands of phone calls, phone numbers, literally. And we looked through those, and we just tried to narrow it down. We cast a pretty wide net initially, just looking for. Uh, phone numbers that were limited to the Phoenix metropolitan area. And we didn't know, based on that call, she, she said she was living in Ahwatukee, the Phoenix area at the time, but we had no indication, number one, was it a hoax? But we took it seriously, but obviously there was a strong potential it was a hoax. And two, um, she said she lived in Phoenix at the time, but when she was calling, where was she calling from? Didn't know that. So she could have been calling from any other uh, location within the United States. But as we started to narrow things down, a couple numbers uh showed up on the radar screen. We followed up on those phone numbers. Those came to dead end, so to speak. And then one particular phone number, and this is about nine months or a year into the investigation, uh, we looked at who that phone was registered to, and it was a cell phone. It came back with a uh, specific name, with the middle name, uh, Suzanne. Uh, that piqued our interest greatly. Uh, we did some additional follow-up, and lo and behold, the person that was registered to that uh, cell phone was listed as a witness on a suicide incident that took place within the city of Phoenix in 2001, uh, actually March 24th of 2001. Uh, so at that point, we were confident, our investigators were, that we had a, a potential uh, suspect identified. Uh, we started working behind the scenes. Uh, we did uh, got her positively identified. We did put her under surveillance. Uh, we looked at her employment. We sent investigators out of state on on one or two occasions up in the Colorado area to do some follow-up. And uh, and then also, we, uh, interesting enough, uh, we found out that when she called your show on November 3rd, 2006, and then uh, she hung up because you put her on the defensive, she placed a phone call to the Phoenix Police Department the following day on November 4th, uh, reporting to us that uh, she was driving home from work, she parked near a park, went for a 10-minute walk, came back to her car, and lo and behold, uh, someone had entered her car, took some personal items out of her phone, which uh, out of her car, which included her cell phone. Oh. And, she, and she said that occurred on November third, and she was just reporting it a day late. So when we had that uh, copy of that police report, we were, uh, you know, beyond a reasonable doubt, we knew we we had identified uh, what we believe was a suspect. 
Uh, we did work with a forensic psychiatrist, uh, try to get some professional advice, uh, get some consulting, because we figured this is, a, uh, this is an extremely difficult case. We had one, one shot at bat, uh, so to speak. Uh, we contacted her just about seven weeks ago for the first time we contacted her in person. We did some surveillance. We knew who she was. We knew she, where she worked. We knew where she lived. We knew where many of her personal habits were, but we haven't actually spoke with her. So about seven weeks ago, uh, our case agent, uh, from a cold case squad, called her up and asked if she'd be willing to stop by one of her police facilities to talk. And she said, uh, absolutely. Um, she worked that day. She stopped by one of our off-site police facilities on her way home, walked in, sat down in an interview room with one of our detectives, and had about a two-hour interview. Um, I can tell you, though, I'm, I can't release all the information, but she was talking to her detective for about an hour, and no time during that first 60 minutes did she question why she was called in. And during that time, our uh, investigator was building a rapport, asking some general questions, getting some background, uh, both uh, professionally and personally, on her. And then uh, it got to the level that we asked uh, some pointed questions. Um, again, I'm somewhat limited what I can tell you, but I can say that uh, she was pretty consistent at that point, uh, telling our detective when asked directly, did you shoot your, your boyfriend? And uh, she denied that. She claimed it was a suicide, said she was upset that maybe she could have prevented it. Uh, but there were, there were some inconsistencies that we found during that interview, and I can tell you there were some very large inconsistencies that, from what she said during the initial, uh, what was uh, initially titled a uh, suicide investigation from 2001, and what she said when she called in your show in 2006. And the information that she provided on your show in 2006 when she said where the victim was shot and specifically with what type of weapon he was shot, um, that, that information is true and accurate. During the initial contact, she told us that she was in her living room. She had an argument with her boyfriend. Um, the argument had started the previous night, last through the morning. Um, according to her, uh, the, the, her boyfriend threatened to shoot himself or kill himself. She shrugged it off and wasn't paying any particular attention. She heard a gunshot, thought he was still joking. She got up from the couch, began to walk toward the kitchen, and at that point she heard a gasping sound. Did not see the victim, didn't look at him. She heard a gasping sound. She got scared. She grabbed her two-year-old child, ran upstairs, called 911, waited for our officers to arrive on scene. And she was consistent with that same statement during the interview. Uh, the problem was um, when she called your show, she gave some very detailed information that uh, she would obviously either had to be uh, shoot the victim or at minimum be in close proximity when that uh, shooting took place. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. That is amazing. And um, how did she react to all of this uh, after the, the interview? Uh, but, what was the reaction? Well, uh, during the most part of the interview, she was actually pretty nonchalant. She was pretty casual about it, which is, uh, uh, you can imagine, first of all, being called in, uh, most people are going to ask questions up front. And, uh, you know, why are, why am I here? What's the investigation about? And she was just playing coy for at least the first, first hour. Uh, when it got to pointed questions, I can tell you one little, one brief moment, she did get emotional, but then she, she recouped rather, rather quickly, um, saying that she was upset that maybe she could have prevented it, but again, denied actually, uh, shooting the boyfriend. Um, I can tell you that, uh, you know, she's been working at the same place for more than 10 years. Uh, she has a pretty steady work history. Some of the things that she did say when she called in your show were accurate. Some were close to being accurate. Um, but, uh, but the details matched, uh, uh, the shooting, the information we had from the, what we believe were, was a suicide initially. Um, and then, uh, she was released. And at this point, just to let you know what we're doing is we contacted, we've been in, in regular communication with the Maricopa County Attorney's Office, and we submitted this uh, investigation for formal charges uh, as of yesterday. And the two charges that our detectives are asking for is one count of first-degree murder and then one count of uh, interfering with a criminal investigation, and that's mainly for filing the false police report the day after she called your show. And I can tell you that our investigators were skeptical uh, when we first uh, listened to the tape, um, they did a great job. They put hundreds of man hours into this. They traveled several locations within the state of Arizona, up to Colorado once or twice, and contacted people in other locations in other states verbally. And they were still, you know, keeping an open mind on it. That's the way our investigators are. That's the way it should be. But when we brought her in and we did the interview, and when she walked out, based on all the information we had at that point, uh, our two very ex uh, experienced and well-trained investigators um, were convinced that she actually uh, committed murder, and as of such, they submitted requesting that that charge be filed.
Wow. Um, do we know anything about this person? What's happened to her since then that we can talk about? Uh, well, just limited. I can tell you she, her place of employment. Uh, she had pretty steady work history, still employed at the same location. It is a medical facility. Um, she, um, when we did contact her, brought her for the interview, uh, we learned through that interview that she uh, has a new live-in boyfriend. Uh, obviously, we contacted and spoke with him uh, since that interview. Uh, we know that um, the victim um, that was uh, originally uh, dubbed a suicide, now that we're asking for homicide charges, uh, that's Mr. Torson Rockwood. Uh, we know that they lived together in Mesa. Uh, they had, they had uh, more or less an on-again, off-again type relationship. They lived together briefly. Um, he was the father of her child. She moved out. She moved to Central North Phoenix, and a brief time later, he moved back into her. And then, uh, again, a short time after that is when the uh, we believe a murder took place. If I recall from the original conversation uh, on this program, uh, she said that he worked at the same medical facility. Was that true? Um, you know, we have. I, I don't have that information available. He was not working at the time the shooting took place. Uh, well, that's what we, she had said in the call. That, she that's said what that he, she had said. She said he quit the job. Right, and then there's there's some likelihood to that. I just I don't have the, his personal information in front of me right now. Uh, but he was unemployed at the time of the shooting. But they did have some prior history. Um, it did appear to be somewhat of a rocky relationship. And uh, she had moved out one time, had a child, and then uh, for whatever reasons they moved in back to, back together again. Uh, I can tell you though, um, and people have asked, well, why didn't we book her? At the time, we believed that we have enough evidence there. We're asking the, pro the Maricopa County Attorney's Office uh, to file charges, and that's, we're going to have another meeting set for next week to d discuss more of the uh, specifics of this, of this case. Uh, but the time we brought in for the interview, um, she was about eight months pregnant. And um, she just recently had a, a second child about two weeks ago. Oh, my God. So, so the boyfriend... I, I I didn't know you'd spoken to him because I was imagining him coming out to the driveway and picking up the newspaper today, and reading this. Uh, well, it broke it broke last night. We had a local reporter that had some public records requests on file. I had spoken to him last week for the first time. I wasn't expecting that article to hit online last night. So I know how the media business is. It's it's uh, you know he took a shot to try to, to, to break this particular. Uh, investigation um, and take a little credit for it. it. It worked out okay because we're done with it. We had submitted the, the charges, but uh, uh, we're trying to delay it for a couple more days. But anyways, it did break last night, and I can tell you it, it, it's at a frenzy level here locally in the Phoenix area as of today. Um, uh, but anyway, she is not booked. Um, she's still living at her residence, and I believe uh, today's her birthday as well. Well, happy birthday. Tawatuki Sue. By the way, we're talking with Sergeant Joel Tranter of the Phoenix Police Department. The most asked question on this program over the last two years is whatever happened to Awatuki Sue. There has been a break in the case. We have been working with the Phoenix Police Department behind the scenes. I'm sorry to say the radio business doesn't have a very good reputation, has a history of trying to pull off hoaxes or April Fool's jokes or other lame stunts. Uh, we take it very seriously, uh, the time you guys put in, uh, the investigative work you do. Uh, we, we take it too seriously uh, to see you guys wasting your time just to help our cause. Uh, and and we are thrilled that you guys took us seriously because uh, we were a serious heart attack. I've been doing this show for a long time. I've been doing talk radio now for uh, almost uh, 30 years. And uh, I will tell you that uh, I knew this was real because women very rarely make prank phone calls to radio shows. Right. Yeah, I appreciate those comments, Tom. We we went early on when this thing uh, initially came to light in November 2006. Uh, obviously, it, it, it stirred the media locally and nationally. And we stepped forward and asked whoever this person is, if it's a hoax, step forward, let us know that so we don't have to invest the manpower and uh, you know, the monetary expenses in this investigation. We can get on with our other responsibilities of working other homicides and other serious cases if this is a hoax. Step forward, let us know that. We got no reply. But on the flip side, we said the same thing. If, if this is, is not a hoax and it's responsible, I tell you what, save everyone a lot of trouble. Step forward, contact us. Let's sit down. Let's, let's have a discussion about this because eventually we're going to find out who you are and where you're at, and we're going to come look you up. Uh, unfortunately, we were forced into doing that. It took a little more than 18 months to, to come to the, the uh, conclusion that we're talking about today. Um, so there was always that opportunity early on for someone else to call us or the suspect herself to just pick up the phone or stop by the police station and talk to us. Uh, I can tell you it, it's 
she had to have some uh, false of, uh, sense of security, thinking she called from the Phoenix area and um, that we weren't going to look into it. And, again, I think it really helped out with your staff and yourself keeping a low profile um, that she didn't, you know, change jobs back up and move to a different state and things like that. She stayed in the same employment. She stayed locally. And once we were able to sift through a mountain of, uh, of material to find out who she was, um, we were pretty excited that she was still here, and that really helped out our investigators. Another thing that I've heard, and again, I, I have to get a lot of this stuff third hand because we're not in Phoenix, is that one of the TV stations apparently has located the parents of the victim in this case. Who no, I, ha I haven't heard that. I can tell you they do live out of state. Uh, I believe they still have the same last name as the victim. Um, there was a number of police reports uh, issued under public records request earlier today. The media uh, is excellent at locating people. Next to our investigators, I'd say the media people are probably the second best people in finding and looking up individuals, so I wouldn't be surprised to that. Uh, our investigators have pre previously spoke to his family. You guys have done such an amazing job. It's been such a pleasure to just cooperate with you guys in any way we could. Uh, we've known a lot of this information for a long time, and as you know, although I have had to live with the criticism of listeners who have accused us of, of, of uh, fabricating this, um, it was more important to me that you guys at least have a shot uh, at doing the investigation, and uh, if you found that there was reason uh, to charge somebody, that you had the opportunity to do that. So we lived with the criticism because we felt that this investigation was more important. We appreciate that, and that's one of the reasons this has come to a successful conclusion thus far, that we have her identified, we've completed the investigation, and we've now forwarded over to the county attorney's office seeking and asking for uh, prosecution. Thank you so much. I know you've got other work to attend to uh, other than talking to us, and uh, we want to let you get back to that. But uh, thank you so much, not just for coming on with us today, but for, for everything since November 2006. It's been fantastic uh, being able to help you guys any way we could. All right. Thank you, Tom. Sergeant Joel Tranter of the Phoenix Police Department, and he's the guy who took us seriously when many people said that the Awatuki Sioux thing was a hoax. We'll come back with more and your telephone calls. Stay right there. Tom Likas. Likas. 1-800-5800-TOM. I'm 42, and I'd love to bang an 18-year-old. That'd be great. It's the Tom Likas Show. It's the Tom Likas Show. And we're talking about a break in the Awatuki suitcase. Our next guest revealed the name of the suspect in the Awatuki suitcase, which is Megan Suzanne Weiss. John Leptich is a reporter, general assignment reporter for the East Valley Tribune, uh, which is located uh, in the vicinity of Mesa, Scottsdale, Tempe, Arizona. Uh, John, thank you so much for joining us here very much for having me um you know there were some folks at the police department who were upset about your story and, and here's why they said to us uh, in some of the uh, off-air phone calls uh, that, that that we had with them that uh, you know they, they're trying to file these charges and they don't want her to leave town and they don't want right. to screw up the investigation we've known the name of this woman for about a year and a half ourselves We've right. had it for a long time. So my question to you is, uh, was it more important to get the story, or was it more important uh, that this woman, uh, if she is guilty of anything, be brought to justice? Um, probably, to be very honest with you, a little bit of both. They did send charges to the county attorney's office today, and they did name her as a suspect today. And I got wind of that, that they were going to do that, so... I, that's why we went with the story for today. Now, they did not give you the name, so how did you get it? I got it from court documents uh, re that, that they had filed seeking well, probable cause statements. Now, now here's the thing. I, I, the way your story was written, and uh, maybe I was reading something into it that wasn't there, it sounded to me almost as if you spoke to someone at the police department who, while they were following policy in not giving you the name, it sounds right. to me like somebody wanted you to find that name and gave you all the information you needed to find. No, they did not. I, I will admit that. Uh, they, they, they were reluctant to to tell me anything. They admitted to me that I was on the right trail 
when I, I, when I told them I had the documents and I read from documents to them. So they, they, they were cooperative, yet until today they would not officially name her as a suspect. So and I was care and I feel like I was careful to indicate in many instances the woman to keep you know, with not not naming her ourselves that yeah this is definitely the girl who called Tom like us right uh, but uh, that name did appear in your piece and uh, that is certainly yeah. uh, now the charges have been filed and that's the name uh, uh, of the person against whom the charges were filed that's correct Megan Suzanne Vice uh, what do we know about her. Not very much. Uh, I've done some an internet search. The only thing I could find was uh, a background where she from, was originally from Valparaiso, Indiana. I uh, don't know anything else about her. Tried to contact her. Did all you know? Did many searches to try to find a phone number and and could not. She has a Facebook so we, we page. Know, we know little about her. She has a Facebook page. Uh, she does. I did not see that. Well. Uh, we we did investigating ourselves, of course. We, Very good. Very we, good. We've kept this quiet though, because the police <laughs> we, asked we us not to say it. That's good. That's very good. Uh, so uh, what has happened? Because we're not uh, not only are we not in Phoenix, uh, the radio station we were on when uh, when Awatuki Sue called in uh, changed format. So we, we are kind of cut off from what's going on. So what is going on now in Phoenix regarding this story? Uh, it's it's gotten national attention because it, you put it up, you put a link. It's been linked to Drudge. It's been linked to the Phoenix New Times. Uh, I haven't heard any. I just got out of work and I haven't really heard any talk on radio. But I think the other you know, the other paper there will probably pick, likely pick it up today for tomorrow's paper, especially since charges were filed with the county attorney's office today. Yes, and uh, are you uh, g going to be following up on this story, or is that absolutely, just gonna... absolutely? I am, and that's why I I made sure I called police today to find out. Hey, because you know, they said the charges, the original story I had said charges would would be filed as early as today, and I just wanted to see if that changed. When it changed, we've updated our story. Were you aware that she has a live-in boyfriend? No, I was not. Were you aware? I, I was told that she was uh, likely pregnant. Uh, she just gave birth, as a matter of fact, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, and today's her birthday. And today's her birthday. Yes. It's her, <laughs> it's her, is it her 30th birthday today? I think it is. Yes, it is. Today's her 30th Happy birthday. Happy birthday, birthday, Megan. Yeah. Happy birthday. Not really. <laughs> yeah, I guess not. Now, somebody told me there was actually some uh, TV footage of her backing out of her driveway today. Uh, I was in the office all day, so I did not see that. I haven't seen it myself, but yeah. apparently she was shouting out, I am not a murderer. And this was a very strange case, because usually when somebody's accused of murder, like, they're in custody. Uh, I, yeah, and, I, and we, we tried to figure out, and then I kept asking, why? Why is there no arrest? And they said that the, the, you know, they did not believe the evidence they had merited an arrest. They did believe it merited bringing to the county's attorney's office for a review and determination. They said that she, they did not feel she was a flight risk, partially because of some statements she had made to them, which they wouldn't reveal to me, and also partially because of her having, having at that point, I did not know she had given birth. They obviously knew that she was going to give birth. I have also heard a rumor that one of the TV stations in Phoenix may have contacted the family of the victim. That's possible. I did have a friend, uh, a person who said he was a friend of the victims, call me today, but he said the parents uh, had moved out of state. And he didn't have any information we on hear, them. We hear it's Utah. I'm sorry? We hear that it's Utah. Ah, all right. That's possible. Yes. We, we, we want this story to be followed up every possible end there is. I'm just imagining uh, the boyfriend uh, coming out, uh, the current boyfriend coming out to the driveway, picking up the newspaper and, and reading this story where they just had a beautiful baby. Look yeah. what happened to the last guy who didn't pay child support, allegedly. The, yeah, that, that would be very interesting. It would certainly be very interesting. Uh, an interesting scenario. Uh, amazing. All right, uh, so you expect this story is going to continue to go through the meat grinder for a while? I would think so. I think it has legs, and I, I think it'll pick up. Again, it's gotten national attention. We certainly will, you know, I will follow it the best I can, getting other to advance it as, as soon as I can and get it up on our website as soon as we can. Well, thank you uh, so much for spending this time with us. We appreciate it.
Well, I enjoyed talking to you, Tom. Thank you so it's much. It's John Leptich, a general assignment reporter for the East Valley Tribune, owned by Freedom Newspapers. They also own the Orange County Register in Southern California right here in our backyard. Okay. Your telephone calls about Awatuki Sue, a break in the case, coming up next. Come, come. Like it, like it. 1 800 5800 Tom. 1 800 5800 866. Do you have kids? By design, I do not. You don't? By design. By design? Yes. Exactly. By dictionary. Stupid bitch. It's the Tom Likes Show. Crime planner. He's not just a radio personality. He's also a crime fighter. One eight hundred five eight hundred Tom. That's our telephone number. Well, this is Daniel on the Tom Likas show. Hello. Hey, what's up, Tom? How you doing? I'm doing okay, Daniel. By the way, I should say that the article from the East Valley Tribune. Along with the uh, telephone call, the MP3 of the original call is on our website, blowmeuptom.com. And some of it's also on our MySpace, which is myspace.com slash T-O-M-L-E-Y-K-I-S. Yes. No, that, um, no I just, uh, I remember listening to that, that chick, man. She called in back in 2006. And um, I always wondered, man, like, what the hell happened? Did, did they follow up on that? Was any cops listening or, or whatever? And, um, you know, I got out of work, got in the car, and, and I heard your conversation with that sergeant. And um, it just clicked, man. I'm like, this is that call, about that call from 2006, about that dumb broad who wanted to who, uh, boast about what she did on the radio. Yeah, and, uh, you know, it fits in with what we always talk about. Here's some chick bragging that her, the father of her kid wouldn't pay child support, so she uh, said she blew him away. And uh, you think I'm not going to follow up on that? Of course I am. Oh, man. I, I mean, basically, I'm just calling in to, to comment on, on you guys, man. This is the best radio I've ever heard since being alive, man. I don't even listen to music no more because of you, man. You are you are the man. Thank you, Daniel. Um, can you give me a favor? Can you take me out like your style? Uh, get off my phone, you jerk. No, that was Bob Grant style. What are you going to do? 1 800 5800 Tom. That's our telephone number. Let's say hello here to Chuck in Portland, Oregon. That's where we were when this call came in from Awatuki Sioux. Hello. Hola, Tomas. Hola. Hey, uh, that officer from Phoenix was saying the story is really blown up in Phoenix. You think there's some program director kicking himself in the ass and emailing out some resumes about now? Well, I will tell you that we had the number one radio program in Phoenix among spoken word formats, number one in the afternoon. Uh, and uh, now the people in Phoenix can't even hear the show where we get to talk about the uh, the way this all broke out. Well, I'll tell you what, Tom. I'm, I, this is Chuck in Portland making a prediction. I predict that Tom Michaels will be back on the air in Phoenix within a week. Well, we'll see, Chuck. Uh, we <laughs> I have a, a more sanguine view of the uh, of the radio business than you, but uh, thank you. From your lips to uh, well, somebody's ears. One eight hundred five eight hundred Tom. Here's Manny on the Tom Likas show. We're talking about the break of the Awatuki suitcase. Hello. Hello, Tom. Uh, I don't know much about the case just when I heard it because I knew it was live on a on an event you had out there. And uh, just now that I'm hearing an update, which is really cool, I'm really happy. So what I'm, what my question is, what's going to happen with that little bitch, uh, Geraldo, man? He's a dirty bitch slap for trying to call you out as a, that it was a hoax. Yeah, well, Geraldo did say, uh, essentially, that it was a hoax, and I'd, uh, I'd love to hear his reaction now. Uh, unfortunately, I won't be able to hear it, because that show I appeared on with Geraldo was canceled. <laughs> You know that. You know what's up with that, Tom. You know what's up with that. Yes, I do. Punk ass bitch. <laughs> Matty, thank you for that. It's one eight hundred five eight hundred Tom. Mail on the Tom Likas show. Hello. Hey, Tom. How you doing? Been listening uh, to you for a long time. Great. That's awesome to hear, man. Bravo for helping these guys out. They did a great job. And I'm really concerned though that this girl might get off on the whole deal because there's no witnesses or anything like that. You know, and, and she does have knowledge of the anatomy and stuff. And she could have looked in and seen that he shot, shot himself in the heart and all that. I'm not trying to be negative. I hope she hangs. I hope she fries for this. And and another thing I wanted to ask you, first of all, uh, 
actually two more things. One, I had a similar situation where I was actually uh, helped involved in, uh, I was involved in solving a crime of a security guard murder. I was in the Air Force in Abilene, Texas, and I saw a car come through my post with a couple of bullet holes in the rear uh, left quarter panel down low near the bumper. And that information led to the arrest of the guys that actually committed the murder. It was awesome feeling. I'm glad those guys are in jail. They're probably out by now, but uh, it's great to know that the, the, our police officers out there doing their job and they're getting these murders and getting them off the streets and stuff. And one more thing. Whatever happened to that girl that peed all over your porch? I haven't heard anything about well, that. Maybe you know that's not quite as important as the story about the person. I understand that. Understand who, that who, who allegedly shot the father of a child? That's true. Uh, who, who, according to the East Valley Tribune, uh, her name is Megan Suzanne Weiss. By the way, even if she's never convicted, even if they can't make the charges stick, the fact that this story appeared in the newspaper, her life is ruined. I mean, you got to go to work in the morning. You, no, you, she's not. She's not going anywhere. You got to. You got to explain to your boyfriend why this story was in the newspaper. Well, hey, we got her. I mean, at the very least, that happened. Now, again, it's the police who say that's who this is, and I tend to side with the police department on most of these matters. Anyway, thank you for the call. Our email address is my name. It's Tom at BlowMeUpTom.com. That's Tom at BlowMeUpTom.com. You can see the article. You can see where we have posted the MP3 file of the original phone call by going to BlowMeUpTom.com right now. BlowMeUpTom.com. Or our MySpace page, MySpace.com slash Tom Likas. The Tom Likas Show.